Okay. So this lecture is uh, about Turing machines. I'm going to start off by defining Turing machines as a slight generalization of a deterministic finite automaton. A Turing machine is supposed to capture what a computer can do. But for now, we'll just view it as a model of computation, which uh, uh, is given some string as input, and it's trying to determine some property of that string. Okay, so, uh, so if you remember what a finite automaton was, it had a finite control, finite state control. And it had access to the input written down as a sequence of letters from some alphabet sigma. So there's an alphabet sigma, and there are some letters in there. And the finite the state control uh, goes through this sequence of letters, updating its state as it goes through the letters and at the end it makes a decision on whether uh, it thinks the string should uh, whether it should accept the string or not uh, a turing machine is a slightly more powerful version of this so let me write down uh, uh, some in words what we, what we're going to allow the turing machine to do and then i'll state it more formally so in words uh, so a turing machine machine uh, uh, has a finite state control too, has a finite state control. It, ha it has the ability to move both left and right as it's going through the input presented on a tape. So, uh, the input is presented on a tape. Is presented on a tape. And the Turing machine has a head. So in here, the, I drew the head as pointing at that particular location, but it can also point at any location at a time. It has a head that can move both left and right. This is unlike a deterministic finite automaton, which can only move right. So you can move both left and right. It decides whether it wants to move left and right based on its current state and what it read. Okay. Uh, and finally, it can not only read what's written on the tape, but it can also write on that tape. So, yeah, so this. Uh, okay, so this is one point. Another point. And finally, uh, the Turing machine can write on the tape. These are the key defining uh, features of Turing machine over a deterministic finite automaton. The input is presented on the on a tape. The Turing machine has a head that can point at a particular location on the tape. And at each stage, it can either decide to move left or right. And the way it decides to move left or right, it depends on its current state and what it sees written on the tape. Not only that, it can also decide whether to write something at every stage, it can decide whether it wants to write something down on the location currently on the tape. So it can, 
yes yeah, so it can write things down yeah, so that's that's what the uh, turing machine can do so there's one final aspect which i haven't said yet which is that this tape is infinitely long okay so the turing machine has the ability to not only overwrite what has been written on the input but it can also write things beyond that and so it has access to a lot of uh, memory so to speak okay so let me also and that is the fine set it's presented on a tape which is infinite in that direction okay so now i'm going to state things slightly more formally so just like in the deterministic finite automaton case there is a set of states there is a start state there is the alphabet sigma over which we are working strings from this language uh, that we're, strings the input is expected to be over this finite alphabet so it's a finite alphabet this is also a finite set of states finite alphabet there's a there's also a tape alphabet the tape alphabet the tape alphabet is the alphabet uh, which is what can be written on the tape so it's a this is a finite yeah for finite alphabet for the inputs this is the finite tape alphabet automatically since the input starts off on the tape we assume that uh, sigma is contained in this and what's more there's a special tape symbol called blank that's also an element of gamma there's the blank symbol that's also in gamma and we assume that the turing machine starts off with the tape have be containing the input followed by infinitely many blanks then there's also a special accept state q accept there's a special reject state q reject this is a state where the turing machine can decide okay i've decided to accept the string i've seen enough it just jumps to q accept and at that point the turing machine halts and the string is accepted similarly it can uh, decide that the it wants to reject by just moving to the state q reject okay uh and uh, so the accept special accept state special accept and halt state and this is a special reject and halt state and the killer piece is the transition function this is what up how the tra the the turing machine updates its state updates what's written on the tape as a function of its current state what's currently written on the tape and how it moves its head based on all this okay so this is delta the transition function what is, what does delta take as input and what does it give as output okay so following what i said it's a function of the current state and what's currently written on the tape and then it decides what state to go to what to write on the on that current location of the tape and whether to move left or right so it is a function delta is a function that maps it takes a state and an element of the tape alphabet and it outputs 
the new state what to write in place of what was already written in that current location of the tape so if it's choosing not to touch what was already written it it will just simply copy the it will simply copy what's written here into this its output uh, tape alphabet symbol will be the same as the input tape alphabet symbol in the special case when it's not writing anything and it also tells uh, the turing machine whether to move the head right or left so it's to left or right these seven items q q0 so the set of states the start state the finite uh, alphabet for the inputs the finite tape alphabet the ex special accept state the special reject state and the special transition and, and sorry not special the transition function which governs how the turing machine works completely uh, this seven tuple is the formal definition of a turing machine yes yeah, so let's uh, write that down uh, a turing machine is a seven tuple a q like sigma gamma q not oh maybe delta next delta q not q accept and q reject as above this is the formal definition of turing machine it's a very compact definition of what it means to compute when we think about how we compute we are heavily distracted by the fact that our brains can store so much i can think of a number from 1 up to 10 to the power 15 and remember it and i can give it a name and i can walk around saying that number to other people but uh, yeah but that's that's a bit of a distraction if i only had a teeny tiny bit of memory i can only store seven bits of memory in my head then uh, then my mind is like a is like the finite control of the turing machine anyway it's like the finite control of a turing machine but uh, yeah but it's just a big finite and maybe we are distracted by the fact that it's uh, so big and we think oh maybe it's infinite no it's not it's finite so so we so if you have finite memory that then you're like the control of the turing machine and when you and even if you have a finite amount of memory you can go around doing computation on very big things you you can have an extremely large number oh okay so i can add to 100 digit numbers how do i do it i don't take the num the first number and remember it in my head and then do some special magic involving that big number what i do is i follow this the elementary school algorithm for addition i write the first number out i write the second number out one below the other aligned properly and then i do a very very local computation where i say okay there's a 7 here there's a 3 here 7 plus 3 is 10 so i put a zero down below and i put a carry of 1 and i take the carry and i take another digit and another digit and i do some local computation involving that and i write something down here and i write something down here and i just do all kinds of writing things all over I don't ever have to sit and memorize the whole number and do things based on that. I I'm I do computation or sorry I look at what's written, I move around based on what's written. I sometimes to help myself I write a few I jot down some marks and symbols around like the carry and uh, and that's how I add very large numbers myself. i'm basically using a finite amount of state and marking things on 
on the paper in front of me and i execute some simple routine again and again and again based on this finite amount of state that i have that's how i do my uh, my computation and turing machines capture the fact that all computation is basically or not all the turing machine model captures all computation that can be done using uh this process namely looking at looking locally at what's been written right now maybe what's currently un, uh written down at a particular location maybe making some extra marks on the side to help you do some further computation around, along it and uh, and writing things down okay so so that's what the turing machine model is it's a harmless looking model not that much different from the deterministic finite automaton but it turns out that it's it's capable of expressing every single algorithm that we uh, that we do that we have come up with and that we that we think about and in a later uh, class you will learn about the church turing thesis which is uh, uh it's not a theorem it's a thesis which means uh yeah i don't know what it means but okay it says that uh, uh we believe that all computation is captured by this model the turing machine okay so just bef before we go on to do uh, uh more things with turing machines uh any questions ah uh, no okay great so then we move on uh okay so what i'm going to do now is give an example of a turing machine so unlike deterministic finite automata nobody ever specifies a turing machine through the seven tuple any reasonable turing machine for a, 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 even a slightly complicated problem is going to be so humongous and so complicated to describe in this extremely formal language we have to resort to describing in words what the turing machine does so i'm going to do that soon i don't know if you'll exactly see the proof of this but I, it, it will be stated that anything that can be done in a classical programming language can also be done by turing machine so if you want to write uh, describe a turing machine that does something something you just have to specify it in a high level programming language like uh, c or something like that uh okay so i'm now going to uh, an example of a uh turing machine okay okay so actually let me say something else. so anyone can define a turing machine a turing machine that does something interesting that's the tricky part okay so uh okay scratch that no example of turing machine what does it mean for a turing machine to do something okay so associated to every turing machine we look at the language of strings that it accepts okay so the language so language of a turing machine m is the set of strings accepted the set of strings accepted by m when is a string accepted well if during the during the execution of the turing machine on uh on that string as input 
Yeah, so it's doing something, computing, computing, computing. At some point, it decides, okay, let's move to queue accept. At that point, it halts and accepts. So those are the strings. The, the set of strings accepted by him. That's when it can accept a string. It may not accept a string. It may decide at some point to reject, at which point it's not accepted. Or it may just keep moving from state to state to state, writing, updating, doing its own computation, and never uh, entering the accept state. In this case, we don't say the string was accepted. This, in this case, the Turing machine went into an infinite loop when when that string was in it. Okay, so uh, just for uh, just to understand exactly what the possibilities are, on a given input x in uh, sigma star <clears throat> m may the One is uh, halt and accept. Two, halt and reject. Or three, go into an infinite loop, which is a not halt. So go into. Oh, so an in infinite loop suggests that it's just doing the same thing again. Okay, let's say that uh, uh, loop infinitely and that is it doesn't halt ever okay. these are the three possibilities for what happens when a turing machine is fed an input x we only only in case one do we say x is in the language of the language of the turing machine m in both other cases, we say X is not in the language. Okay, so this is the set of strings accepted by uh, uh, by uh, Turing machine M. Uh, so this is the language of Turing machine M. It's also called the language. It's also called the language recognized. By M. This aspect that there's an infinite loop possible, this is unique to the Turing machine case. In the deterministic finite automaton case, the, mach the automaton just read the input left to right. At the end, it was done. Now, since we give the ability to move, move both left and right, and also give the ability to write things and uh, write all the way across the infinite on the entire infinite tape this extra possibility of infinitely looping arises this is unfortunate but it's almost unavoidable you can define other versions of uh, okay i don't know what you mean by unavoidable i take that back uh, Yes, you can define other models of computation that don't have this infinite loop feature, but then those models are weaker than what Turing machines can do. Turing machines are more powerful than all those. And the goal of Turing while defining Turing machines was to uh, was to define a model that captured every possible uh, procedure for computation that 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 people can do. Okay. Yep. So now let me uh, give an example of a Turing machine recognizing a nice language. Okay, so that's uh, okay. So I'm going to start with an example which we studied in the deterministic finite automaton section of this course. It was an it was a language which cannot be recognized by deterministic finite automaton. I'm now going to show that this language L is Turing recognizable. This is the language of a string W, sharp W, where W is a string in zero one star. Uh, this language is easily seen not to be regular, but we'll see that the extra power in the definition of Turing machines 
uh, allows it to allows Turing machines to recognize this language. So I'm just going to describe this Turing machine to you in a in an informal way, telling you what the states of the Turing machine represent, and uh, I'll just say it informally. It everything I say can be translated into a formal specification of what uh, the set capital Q is, the set of states, what uh, the transition function delta is, and and all that. So the, so everything I say can be easily translated into a formal specification of a Turing machine. Uh, humans can't really understand each other if they talk in formal spe language specifications of Turing machine. So the high level idea that I give uh, and you receive is uh, the more important part when you design a Turing machine. Later, we'll, you will see, as I said, that uh, uh, I mean, everything that you can do in a standard programming language can be done by Turing machine. So uh, later, after you've seen a little bit more, in this course, uh, you can just specify a Turing machine by writing a program in a high-level programming language, and that specifies uh, what it, uh, something that a Turing machine can do. OK, so for this language L, let me just describe how a Turing machine would recognize this language. So it expects on its tape, so its tape, it expects to see dub, some string W for, OK, so that's a whole bunch of. Uh, cells there in the of the tape then there's a sharp symbol and then it expects to see another whole bunch of w's and then after that it expects to see blank 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 the rest of the tape should just be full of blanks there should be nothing else on the tape it should just be w sharp w that's what we expect the turing machine to see so what the turing machine is going to do is uh, the following it will start off at the beginning it will mark Okay, so it's going every uh, letter that it sees before the sharp, it's going to try to mark it off against a letter that it sees after the sharp. Okay, so the the tape alphabet, this is already going to give a big hint about what uh, uh, what it is, is going to be sigma. So that's zero, one, sharp. Okay. It also has to have blank because that's always the case. Good. And then there's more. So it's going to be a marked zero. This is a special character, which means, uh, which is going to mean there's a, there was a zero in the input in this location and I've already seen it. Or I've already accounted for it. That's what the mark on top means. Sorry, it means in the sense that that's what uh, we interpret it to mean when we design this Turing machine. So one dot. Okay, I think that'll be enough for, for this. If not, we'll go back and modify. Okay, so this is uh, this is the tape alphabet. The way the Turing machine works is okay. So it goes to the first symbol written here. Uh, let's see. It goes to the first symbol written here. it sees uh, the, that's the first uh, the the head starts off at the beginning of the tape whatever it sees there it it knows that say there is zero or a one oh okay uh, okay this is some special case if it's already a sharp okay but okay so if it's zero then it will replace that zero with a zero dot if it's a one it replaces that with a one dot if it's a zero it also goes into a special state which means I just saw zero on, on the left hand side. And then it moves all the way from here, keeps moving right until it sees sharp, after which it expects to see the same letter that it saw in the very beginning. Okay, so that's what it's what we're uh, the intended execution of the Turing machine on a string that's legal, the, that is actually in the language, is that. It's going to mark letters which are on the left of the sharp against letters on the right of the sharp. So it will see a letter here and then keep moving to the right. Once it sees the sharp, it will keep moving further to the right, crossing all the letters that it has already seen. How does it know it's seen a letter? By, uh, by the dot marked above it. Okay, so I'm going to write this now in words. Okay, so 
uh, we start off. So this is step one was is mark uh, the first. OK, so if the first letter not the first, if the, the letter under the tape, letter under the head, the head is uh, zero. Uh, replace it. We're assume so the step one is when we are we're going to assume we are looking at the first unmarked letter to the left of the sharp sign. If the letter under the head is zero, replace it with zero dot move into stu state uh, state uh, I saw a zero uh, on the left of sharp Good. So it moved into that state. And okay. Okay, that's one. Uh, okay, that if the letter under the head is one, replace it with one dot, move into a state. I saw a one on the left. That's another state. These two states have how how does the Turing machine behave when it's in one, in one of these two states? If it's in this state, the way it's going to behave is keep going right. Just keep going right until you see. So if until you see a sharp. After you see a sharp, keep going right. So that means uh, once you see a sharp, then you move into another state, which means I saw a zero on the left of sharp, and I also saw the sharp. And keep moving right some more. Keep moving right until you see an unmarked zero or one. At that point, check that the first unmarked zero or one letter on the right of the sharp is the same as is a zero. OK, so let me, let me say that again. If you just saw a zero on this side of the show, so uh, oh, another picture. This is the tape. There's lots of blanks at the end. Okay. The sharp and the lots of characters here and then lots of characters here. And in, in an intermediate state of the computation, some of the letters here are going to be marked with dots. I'm writing X there. It's going to be marked with dots. And good. That means that they have already been seen. And this has already been seen. And uh, if you haven't already gone into, if at any point you find the some character on the left of the sharp does not equal the corresponding character on the right of the sharp, we are just going to reject state and reject outright. And yeah, if that hasn't happened yet, then you just keep going to the left of the sharp and then back to the right of the sharp, to the left of the sharp and back to the right of the sharp. The Turing machine is moving around a lot. It's a it's a, a busy body. It's it goes, it keeps going left as much as it can to the first character that is not marked. How do you find the first character that's not marked? Uh, you go to the first character. You keep going until you see a character that's marked, and then move right, and then you know that you're the first character that's not marked. So, the, so that's uh, how you find what the first character is. The first unmarked character is on the left of the sharp. Then you start moving to the right. You wait for the sharp. You should see only one sharp. Then you keep going to the right. You see a whole bunch of marked letters. You don't have to do anything about them because they were already taken care of in previous executions of the, uh, in the previous in the previous uh, part of the execution of the Turing machine. 
keep going right and finally you reach the first unmarked character on the right of the shaft and then make sure that what you saw there was what you saw there okay good now we are uh, okay so we we keep doing this moving left and right until at the very end uh we keep doing this moving left and right until at the very end we have made sure that all the characters on the left of the shaft are, are matched by all the characters on the right of the shaft uh so at the end at the end uh we check that there are no unmarked characters uh on either side of the shot so sipsis textbook has a bunch of examples of uh turing machines for doing specific things in written out in elaborate detail uh i highly recommend looking at them during so this turing machine did not really use the infinite power the power of the infinite tape that uh, is available it only worked within the space used by the input uh, but it did use the power of an expanded alphabet expanded tape alphabet uh turing machines can use the power of this extremely long tape using that to store intermediate computations of things uh right so this small example is this is just a small example just using one tiny aspect of uh, how what turing machines can do they can actually do anything that a high level programming language can do uh, okay so this is the end of video 1 i'm now going to in the next video uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, turing we talk so we define turing recognizable languages we're going to talk about another important notion the notion of turing decidable languages which are those languages that can be uh, this for which a turing machine can take a string and tell you whether that string is in the language or not after halting for sure this is opposed to the as opposed to the current definition of turing recognizable where we give turing machines the option of uh, going into an infinite loop such turing machines i mean they are nice they do recognize languages in a certain sense but these are not something that you would want to call as a subroutine in while doing something else because they may just go off into an infinite loop if their input presented to them is not uh, uh, if the input presented to them is not uh, in the language so uh, we'll talk about this important notion of turing turing decidability and that would be the topic of the next class okay uh, thanks